quick. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 13. Praise the Lord. All right, on Wednesday nights we're uh, doing now uh, into another series uh, about being... Uh, about God's principles of service. Uh, we talked uh, a lot about the basics. Uh, uh, we went through that series, just the basics on the Christian life. And again, if there's uh, maybe some things uh, that we've went over or there's ever a, a lesson that maybe uh, you'd like to get a copy of, you didn't get all the notes, or if you uh, would like to just talk more about those things, again, I'm, all, I'm open for that. Uh, anytime you can come and uh, asked and we could meet or whatever that maybe if you'd like uh, some more information anything like that uh, I always like to open that up there to let people know ask questions amen I, I only can teach so much uh, in one lesson sometimes and uh, I only can get so much in there but there's always so much more the Bible uh, is you, you couldn't you can't exhaust God's Word. There's so much in it and there's so much more information. Uh, so a lot of these things uh, are just kind of geared to give you a good basis and you can study things yourself. Amen. Take these verses and study them and, and go through God's Word yourself in your own time and let the Lord speak to you there as well. But uh, just remember anytime if we ever go through something you'd like, uh, the, the notes or something, uh, I, I, I have an open door for that. Amen. But so we've been lear learning about God's principles of service. Last week we learned about being teachable. So when we serve the Lord in our service for God, as we uh, now we've covered those basics in our life, and we're now trying just to serve the Lord and God, and uh, we're, we're, being, we're serving in the church, and now God has some principles that we can follow to be better servants. Uh, it's kind of like when you go and you work at a job, uh, and you get hired on, you're not the expert the first day there. You're not the expert the second day there. You learn principles or you learn uh, things that can help you to be a better worker. You learn kind of the tricks of the trade. You learn kind of how to do things better and uh, you learn how to, to be a, a better worker. And that's usually the goal or ought to be the goal of anybody when you have a job to do the best job that you can. But when we serve the Lord, we want to be the best servant for Christ that we can possibly be. We want to serve God as much as we can. We want to give God our entire life. Uh, and so these principles will help us to be better servants. These are good principles of service. Tonight we're going to talk about, as you, as you see there on the back of the Bible study guide, about being, uh, oh, I put servanthood, excuse me, servant-hearted. So I've uh, already one mistake, bad pastor. Here we go. So let me circle that one. There we go. Servant-hearted. Uh, servanthood would be the subject, but we're talking about being servant-hearted, uh, having a servant's heart. In the ministry, uh, and again, we'll go to Galatians chapter 5, verse number 13. We'll read this scripture real quick. Uh, if you'll follow along there, Galatians 5, 13, the Bible says, For brethren, uh, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. This verse is referring to the fact that we've been saved. We've been born again. Praise the Lord. Amen. We have heaven as our home. Now we're saved. God has given us liberty through salvation. But our liberty in being saved is not to be used as an occasion to the flesh. In other words, it's not an excuse to go out and just live for the devil. See, a lot of people think, they say, well, if I just get saved and I get forgiven, then I can just go live the way I want to. And God says, no, 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 amen. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside, and God is going to, and the Holy Spirit, when you do wrong, He's going to stand there and go, you know better. It's kind of like that look as moms give you. The Holy Spirit is like, it reminds me of my mother, or my mother reminds me of the Holy Spirit, I guess I should say. When I was in church, I can remember, it didn't matter where I was at in the auditorium. When I, when I was doing something I knew I shouldn't have been, you could feel mom looking at you. I don't know, uh, moms, it's, only, it's, it's something only moms have. You could feel mom, and she would have this, <clears throat> she would do. And you could hear it clear across the room. Nobody else would look. It would just be me, Audrey, Mitchell, and Trevor, and you would, you would see all of us look at the same time. <laughs> and we were like, oh, who's in trouble? And uh, she would look at you and just give you that look, and you would say, Yes, ma'am, and you'd straighten up no matter what you were doing. Uh, and, and then if she called you and told you to come sit by her, then you knew you were getting a spanking when you get home. And uh, so, but it, the Holy Spirit's the same way. We get saved and we know, you know, we're living our lives and we do things we know we shouldn't do. And you kind of feel that Holy Spirit go, <clears throat> you go, oh, <laughs> yes, sir. And you can either choose to yield to the Holy Spirit or be rebellious. 
And so, and this is what the Bible's talking about. We're not to use our liberty as an excuse to go live for the devil. We're not to use our liberty as an excuse to live how we want to and say, well, I get to go to heaven now, I'm saved, so I'll just go, I'll just see y'all in heaven, have a good one. God says no, because the Bible says that the Lord will chasten His children. But we're to use our liberty to do what? To serve one another in love. God wants us to be servants. God doesn't want us to live our lives for ourselves. God wants us to live our lives for each other. Amen. Do you have a servant's heart is what we call it. Are you uh, being a servant, being servant-hearted is not, that, is not just that you serve, but that it's your heart and desire. See, a lot of people serve because they have to. Maybe they're made to. But it's different when you have a heart and a desire to be a blessing. Being servant-hearted is not just being willing to serve, but it's looking for an opportunity to serve. See, a lot of people will serve because you have those people at work. It's kind of like you know, the same thing. We go back to work. You have people that do their duty and do their job, and then that's it. They won't step out and help you because, well, that's not my job. I finished. And then you have those people that are there to work and get the job done that when they're finished with what they're doing, they'll step out and help you and do this and do this. That's somebody looking to, be, to work. A servant's heart is the same thing. Sometimes we serve the Lord and then we do our duty and we say, well, God, I'm finished. And God says, but there's still more work to be done. The story has been told that there was a non-commissioned officer who was directing the repairs of a military building during the American Revolution. He was barking out orders to the soldiers under his command, trying to get them to raise a heavy wooden beam. As the men struggled in vain to lift the beam into place, a man who was passing by stopped and asked the one in charge why he wasn't helping the men. With all the pomp of an emperor, the soldier responded, Sir! I'm a corporal. You are, are you? said the man. Well, I was not aware of that. Then taking off his hat and bowing, he said, I ask your pardon, corporal. Then the stranger walked over and, and helped the soldiers lift the heavy beam. After the job was finished, he turned and said, Mr. Corporal, when you have another such job and have not enough men, send for your commander-in-chief and I will come and help you a second time. The corporal was astonished to learn that the man speaking to him was General George Washington. Amen. <laughs> and it's a simple illustration of the fact that great men that are leaders learned long ago before they became a leader that their position is not given them to lord over people but to serve. God says it's the same way in the Christian life. We should not look at who we are to be something better than anybody else but look at it as, an, as liberty or an opportunity to be a servant. We should never become too big to do the little things. A person once said, and this is this, uh, well, let me give you first, hold on, before I give you that. What does it mean to be servant-hearted? Let me give you that. Servant-hearted means seeking to meet the needs of others. To be servant-hearted means you seek to meet the needs of others. You're not seeking to meet your own needs. You're not seeking to meet what fulfills your satisfaction, your flesh. You seek to meet the needs of others. And the good thing is, is that that's a never-ending responsibility because there's always needs. Amen. The next thing there, if you are too big to do little things, then you are too little to do big things. If you're too big to do the little things, then you're too little to do big things. This is why in the Bible we see that Jesus in Mark 10, 44 said, And whosoever, will, whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. See, a lot of times we as Christians get to where we say, Well, God, how come I'm not doing such and such? And we wonder why God hasn't given us the responsibility or God hasn't led to give us more responsibility, but God says it's because if you're too big to do even the little things of God's Word, then God won't trust you to do the big things. We have to become a servant in everything. Not just a servant where we want to be a servant, but a servant to where God wants us to serve. The absence, the absence of a servant's heart is really and simply the absence of humility. When somebody does not want to serve or they don't want to, 
they don't want to do the little things. Really, what it is is it's a pride issue. I'm better than that is what we think. I, I don't deserve to have to do that. Because sometimes we, get, we think because of our position or who we are that we are better than what the task is. But honestly, we deserve to be in hell. So any task that we can do for the Lord is cream on top of the cake. Amen. Jesus in His humility took the form of a servant. Philippians 2, 5-7 through says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It was once said that Jesus could have picked Jesus could have come and been anything he wanted to on this earth, but he chose to be a servant. Likewise, if we could choose to be anything for God, we should choose to just be a servant. Amen. I think uh, the best place you can find yourself is if God asked you, like Solomon, if he could give you anything that you, could, that you wanted, any position, pastor, missionary, evangelist, whatever it may be, may our heart's reply be, I just want to be a servant. Amen. Wherever God can use me. Amen. And if you'll be, have a humble heart, then boy, I promise you God can do big things with your life. Amen. Have you surrendered your will to God? Do you look for opportunities to serve those around you? Do you wait for opportunities to come to you? Is your mind consumed with your own needs or others' needs? Do you look for recognition when you serve others? Do you allow others to be first? Do you look up to those who exemplify a servant's heart? Are you willing to give of your time and possessions to help meet the needs of others? Do you respond to those in need with criticism, or do you look for ways to fulfill the need? Is there anyone who you're not willing to serve? And can, can others depend on you when they are in need? All of these questions point back to ask us, are we servant-hearted? Because the next thing there, being a servant is giving yourself. Being a servant is giving yourself. There was a, once the story of a, a pastor, and I, I thought this was a neat story. I thought I'd tell it to you, and it's a true story. A pastor that uh, he was having a missions theme program and talked about wanted to, uh, people to give and, and talked about we need to give for the Lord and, and, uh, and help support and all these things. It was just, just preaching. And what they were going to do is at the end of the week, they were going to have a big, uh, 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 like a bucket thing uh, down front. And he was going to tell people to come and, and give what they can for the Lord and, and, uh, and things like that. And so people, you know, he was preaching all week about giving and giving and, and trusting God and, and, how, you know, and all of these things. So there was a family with uh, uh, a family with a young little boy. He was their only child, and uh, he was hearing pastor preach. And he would listen, and he would hold a little teddy bear in his hand, and uh, while he would listen to the pastor preach. And at the end of the week, they came and time to time to give. So the pastor gives the call, and people come and they begin to give, and they give uh, money, and they give uh, what they have. Some people threw in rings that they had and sold. Some people, you know, I mean, they just gave every. Some people gave everything they had that they could. And so this little boy walks up to the pastor, and the pastor looks at him and says, Well, you know, howdy, son. And the little boy uh, hands the pastor the teddy bear. And the pastor kind of, with a tear in his eye, said, Well, son, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And he said, No, sir. He said, I want you to keep that. He says, I'm gonna, And he climbs into the bucket, and he says, I don't have anything to give, so I'll give myself. Amen. And I thought that was a neat story. <laughs> because the best thing that you can give the Lord is not what you have, it's yourself. God doesn't want what you have. Boy, God owns everything. Owns the cattle on the hills. Owns the, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills and he owns the taters in the hills. He owns it all. But God doesn't own you unless you yield yourself to him. That's what being a servant is. Being a servant is not giving God everything you have. It's giving yourself. When a servant in the Old Testament... Uh, fulfilled his time uh, in the Old Testament. They uh, had servants, and when they uh, fulfilled what they called their time and they were given the choice to leave, a servant could either leave or he could stay. 
The only reason, according to the Old Testament, that a servant would stay with his master is because his servant loved his master. And that's in Exodus uh, chapter 21, verses 5 through 6. You can read that. The underlying reason that we should serve the Lord is the same as why a servant would stay with a master, because he loves his master. We should serve God because he first loved us. Now, real quick, just a few things. This isn't the, the, the uh, five points there, but how to be servant-hearted. Well, first thing we can do is we can ask God to help us be a servant. Have you asked God? Psalms 119, 125 says, I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. First thing you could do is ask God to help you be a servant. Say, Lord, I need your help. How do I be a better servant? And God will help through his word give you the understanding how you can be a better servant. Everything starts with asking. God says that he has wisdom. Ask God and he will give you the wisdom for whatever it is that you're seeking. Next, start serving in your own home. So how can we be a, start being servant-hearted? 1 Peter 3, 8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Start serving in your own home. Amen. Find ways to serve each other. Serve your family. Amen. If you, uh, you know, serve uh, as uh, brothers and sisters, serve each other. Brothers and uh, mom or uh, sons and daughters, help mom and dad with the dishes. Just serve in those little things. Helping. Amen. Serving in your, even in your own home. Find ways to serve a wife, serve her husband. A husband, serve the, the, the wife. And find ways to, to help each other. Next, how to be, a, how to be servant-hearted. Think of others more than yourself. Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Think of others more than yourself. How often is it that we spend time thinking how we can help meet the needs of others? Uh, a great preacher one time said, You can always tell how selfish we are, just look at our prayer life. In our prayer life, when we pray, we pray for all the things we need. How many prayer requests are, you know, are the requests that others need? Amen. And I know it's true of me. I, I often try to look for ways to pray for others. Amen. Because you know what? God knows my needs. Amen. And God will take care of those things. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for your needs, but how often do you pray for others? Because that's what Jesus was here to do. He was here to serve others. And I believe that in your prayer life, if you'll pray more for the things that others need more than yourself, then God will take care of your things even more so. Next thing, how to be servant-hearted, do the little things for others. Luke 16.10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Do the little things for others. Never be too big to pick up a piece of trash on the floor. Never be too big to uh, uh, help clean a toilet. Never be too big to maybe go and, and help somebody uh, vacuum or clean or, or, or even uh, buying groceries. For, or uh, There was a family in our church, and I tell you, I learned so much. They, uh, they, uh, we had a man that would come to our church, and I won't give you his name uh, because he's still alive, but he's, he doesn't come to church anymore, but he came for a long time. And boy, when he came, you knew he was there because he stunk. I'll just be honest. Boy. It was, it was tough. He, he stunk. He, would, he, he did not have a shower. He did not have electricity. He did not have running water. He lived by himself. He, was, uh, he, just, he, he stunk. And so he would come. And, you know, as a young man, my, my, my thought was always, why doesn't he shower? Why doesn't he this? You know, why does, you know, that's how I would think. And I remember him coming to church one day, and he, had, he was shaved. Boy, he'd taken a bath. And I thought, wow, praise the Lord, he finally did it. <laughs> you know, as a young man, my first thought was, good night, about time. And then he kept coming to church that way. And I thought, well, good night, about time. You know, good, he got, he got, he, he's, he's taking care of himself. Hygiene, amen. And then a, a, a little later after I learned, there was a family in our church that they were an older couple. And uh, they took him to their house and they fed him a meal. They gave him a razor. They let him use their bathroom. And every week they would let him come and take a shower, and eat a meal. And I, <laughs> you talk about Holy Spirit conviction, I thought, boy, I'm a terrible Christian. Here I was thinking about time. And they just looked for a way to help him. Because when he would come to church, people would steer clear of him because he, he, he smelled terrible. He really did. And so they saw a need and they filled it. And boy, they did it for many years faithfully. 
But you know what? How many of us would have been willing to let a man come into our home, smell like that, and give him a, give him a towel, give him a razor, or you know things like that? Now, I'm not saying that you have to do that. I'm just saying that if God puts that on your heart, don't, don't say no. Amen. Amen. Whatever God asks you to do, the little things. See, this is the problem. We want to do all the big things for God, but we don't want to do the little things. That's why God doesn't use some of us. That's why God can't use some of us until we're willing to humble ourselves and just do the little things that is found in God's Word, then God will never ask us to do more. Amen. Amen. We've got to humble ourselves. Even me as a pastor, God will never let our church, and as I lead, God will never let us go farther if we're not willing to help for the little things in people's lives. Next, uh, how to be servant-hearted. Don't look to be served. Galatians 6, 5 says, For every man shall bear his own burden. If you're going to be a servant, and if you're going to have a servant's heart, don't look to be served. Don't uh, serve somebody and then expect that in return. <laughs> uh, we all know, uh, we've been taught that many times, uh, probably from parents, uh, teachers, uh, probably your mom and dad have taught you this principle, but you never uh, do something for somebody else and then expect something in return. And that's a biblical principle. Next, how to be servant-hearted, be humble. And whosoever shall exalt himself, Matthew 23, 12, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. God says be a humble person. Don't be prideful. Uh, pray for a humble heart. Next, always consider Christ. Hebrews 12.3 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Remember what Christ has done for you and what Christ has suffered and what Christ went through, and that will cause you to want to be more of a servant. Amen. Jesus died and gave his life for the for the, the greatest of sinners to the least of sinners. By that I mean Jesus died for the poorest of people to the wealthiest of people. From those that nobody will ever know about on the backside of Africa to the President of the United States, Jesus gave His life for everybody. Then how dare we consider ourselves a servant only to those that we deem worthy? Because Jesus died for everybody. The greatest servant of all gave his life for every person that walks the face of this earth. And so that means we and ourselves should be the servant of everybody that Jesus died for. So when you look at somebody and ask, should I, could, should I, could I, ask if Jesus did. Amen. Next, look for needs in the lives of others. How to be servant-hearted? Philippians 2, 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now this is not saying that you're to break the bank and just spend all of your money that you have. Amen. This is saying that when you have an opportunity, when God blesses you with above and beyond what you have, you meet your budget, you pay the bills, God gives you extra. Then take that extra and set aside one time where you help somebody meet, somebody meet their needs. Help somebody buy groceries. Help somebody, and uh, my wife and I, and even as in college, I remember uh, I was, uh, somebody taught me this, and, uh, and I began to try to find a way uh, to do this. And you know what? You, you watch God bless you. When, when you begin to take what God gives to you and say, God, I'm going to help somebody, somebody else's needs, then you find out that God begins to give you more. But God doesn't give you more to use on yourself. But then this is what's funny is you'll find that God takes care of you in an even greater way. It's like a, a man that I know, his name is Dr. Russell Anderson, a great man. He came to our church. He's a millionaire. And uh, he, uh, he told me how that what he does at his church, and again, I, I, I don't have the means to do this, but when he goes home in his church, he finds uh, one person, uh, I forget what he said, one person a week or one person a month or something, and uh, one family, and he buys them groceries. And he doesn't tell anybody. He gives the money to his pastor, and he tells them, go buy them groceries. He said, and, I, and he told me, he said, now don't you tell anybody I told you that. <laughs> he said, and I'll never tell you who it was. He said, but I do that because God has blessed me. And he said, if I don't continue to help others, then God's not going to continue to give me more. And uh, let's remember to do that. Amen. Next, remember that your rewards are in heaven. How to be servant-hearted, remember your rewards are in heaven. Matthew 6, 20 says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust also doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. If you'll serve with the mindset that God will reward you and not man, you'll never stop serving. 
If, you'll, if you serve with the mindset that uh, I'm going to serve for what man can give me, then you'll stop serving real quick. Amen. Now, into the lesson real quick, and then we'll be done, and uh, we'll get out of here in enough time to go to McDonald's. Here we go. Lesson le- number A. The Bible example of one who had a servant's heart. We're going to turn real quick, I'm sorry, to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to look at a Bible example of somebody who had a servant's heart and give you somebody that you can read and study after through this week and, and learn from their life. But I'm just going to give you a few pointers. 1 Kings chapter 19, we're going to read verse 16 through 21. The Bible says in verse number 16, And Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of <coughs> that guy shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael, Hazael, that guy, shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence, and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him, and cast his mantle upon him, and he left the oxen, and ran after Elijah, and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him, and took a yoke of oxen, and slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose, and went after Elijah, and ministered unto him. We see this man named Elisha. God called, uh, God called him through uh, his prophet Elijah to be a servant. And we see uh, why God also used Elisha one day later to be used of him in the ministry. Elisha was a big part, uh, in, in, as you see and you read in 1 Kings. He did twice as much as Elijah did. He, he did uh, uh, twice as much miracles. He did twice as much in his life. And God used Elisha in a great way. But we go back and see why God allowed Elisha to be used. We look here first, letter A. Like we talked about already, he was not too big to do the little things. 2 Kings 3.11. And this is, again, you can study this man's life. It's purely given for you to take home, read, study after him. But 2 Kings 3.11 says, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Elisha was Elijah's servant. And when Elijah cast his mantle on Elisha, the Bible says, Then Elisha rose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Elijah's, Elisha's heart was displayed when Elijah uh, uh, went to heaven and God allowed Elisha to be used. But Elisha put some things into practice. And as we saw, he wasn't too big to do the little things. He served Elijah. He poured water on his hands. He did all the little things for the man of God. He was like Elijah's right-hand man. And you know, when you find anybody that God used in a great way in the Bible, you always find that they were serving God's man somehow. They somehow were serving the Lord by serving God's man. Let me give you a great principle. No matter where you go through your life, whether you stay here or whether you go and serve in another church, if you'll serve the Lord by being a servant to the man of God somehow, I promise you, that God will use your life. Not saying that I'm some great Christian, because I'm not. Not saying that one day when I'm not here and the next pastor that comes is going to be, is going to be some great person or if the Lord leads me somewhere else or if I stay here for the next 50 years. It's not about who Elijah was, but it's about who Elijah represented. Because Elijah it was God's man. And Elisha viewed the Lord, as he was serving God by serving the man of God. Boy, the biggest thing that a lot of, if we see in the Bible, we learn from men like Korah. We learn from uh, men in the New Testament that they cursed the man of God. They, uh, the children that said to the man of God, go up thou bald head, and God brought she-bears after them. When people lose a respect or when they're not willing to do these little things like Elisha for the man of God or towards the Lord, then God shows that they're not uh, that God never uses them in a great way, and again, not because the pastor is uh, some great person, but God has given a pastor to serve the people, and the pastor is the shepherd, amen. And by serving the pastor, you serve the Lord. 
long before God ever called me to pastor, and I, and again, not to, and I and I don't brag, but but God, long before God ever asked me to pastor, I remember I always looked for ways to serve whoever my pastor was, and I never wanted to pastor. <laughs> I, I mean, I knew I wanted to eventually. But I told the Lord, no. I said, not yet. I don't, I don't feel ready. Amen. I said, I want to continue to serve. But that's what God wants in each and every one of us, a heart to serve. And it starts by serving the man of God. You watch, and watch people that when they have a heart against God's man, that I promise you they won't stay and serve very long. When you're not willing to look at the man of God and say, yes, sir, then I promise you God will never use you. If the pastor tells you in his church, well, this is what I want to do, or this is what I believe the Lord's led us to do, and you watch and somebody's heart is one that says, well, I don't care, I'll still do it my way, then God will move you, or God will do something in your life, but you'll never be able to use to the ability that God wants you. And it's not because, again, because the pastor's anything special, because the Lord knows I'm the worst sinner in the room, but it's because that's how God has set up doing those little things like Elisha did for Elijah. Letter B, he was found working before called to service. Elisha was found working before called to service. Look there, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. You can look that up. Uh, so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Elisha was not a lazy man. God used Elisha, I believe, because Elisha also was found working. Boy, when, when Elijah came by and, and God said, go find Elisha, he found him in the field, plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. That's huge. <laughs> 12 yoke. There's two oxen, oxen per yoke. So if we look at that, that means there's 24 oxen. I don't know how this guy is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, whether they're all in a row, whether they're all... I don't know, but he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Elisha knew how to work. The principle there is God does not use a lazy man. God will not use us if we're lazy. If we're just sitting by and saying, well, when God calls me, then I'll do something. But being servant-hearted means you're looking for, to serve till God tells you what He wants you to do further. You know what God wants you to do right now. So Elisha knew God hadn't called him to be a prophet or serve under Elijah. So Elisha did what God knew he, what he knew God wanted him to do to do now. And a lot of Christians, we get to where we think, well, I'm just going to wait for when God tells me more. But God will never tell you more till you do the things that God's given you to do now. Amen? Do the basics. Start with what God's given to you. And if you can't be faithful, as the Bible says, in that which is least, God won't ask us to do more. Letter C. He would not give in or give up. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, we see a principle here. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Another reason I believe that the Lord used Elisha in a great way and he had a servant's heart because part of being a servant means you don't give in and you don't give up. No matter what the world does, no matter what the devil does, no matter what anybody else does, one that is a servant that is convinced that the master who he serves is worth serving never stops. Amen. We never say, well, God's all of a sudden not worth it. Well, all of a sudden, it's not worth going to church. Well, all of a sudden, it's not worth serving the Lord. Well, all of a sudden, it's not worth tithing, all those things. A true servant knows that his master loves him and never questions the master. Don't ever give in or give up in your service for the Lord. Elisha was determined because he knew that God told him to stay with Elijah till the very end. And Elisha wasn't going to give that up. So we as Christians should not have a give in or give up mentality to where we just, the slightest bit of oppression that comes by, oh, we blow over. Like weeds, we have no root, as the Bible says. Have a backbone, amen. Have, ha, don't give in. Don't give up in serving God. Don't give in or give up to the world and your standards and, and what you believe and in God's Word, amen. Next, he was willing to serve when his peers were not. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse number 3. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? 
And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elisha uh, in 2 Kings, uh, even when those around him discouraged him and told him not to, he told him, for lack of a better term, hush. Even when those around him were not willing to serve, he still served. You know, there are going to be people all the time when you're trying to serve God that are going to try to discourage you from serving. Boy, there's going to be, there, it, may be, it may even be family. It may be friends. It may be your best friends you've had for years. But when you try to get in busy for the Lord and you watch as you try to begin serving the Lord faithfully and you become faithful to church and soul winning and prayer meeting and all of these things and you try to serve God and do something for the Lord, you watch as all of a sudden everybody begins to question you. Everybody begins to discourage you and says, well, how come you're doing that? Or why don't you come with us anymore? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why do you drag your family there? Why don't you let, the, let your kids do this? All of those questions. Boy, I, can never, I, I can't count on my hand how many times kids my age used to ask me, you know, how come you go to church every, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? Why don't you come play? Why don't you come do this? You know, and as a young man, I remember, you know, you begin to think, how come we don't? You know, you just wonder. And then you go to dad and you say, Dad, how come we don't? <laughs> My dad very lovingly and patiently uh, through many years uh, taught me we do it because we love the Lord. And you know, as I begin to realize more of what God's done for me through His Word, you know, I don't really care what people say anymore. I love God. And even if somebody else is willing to turn their back on God and turn their back on His Word and turn their back on what the Bible says... Doesn't matter to me because God loves me and I love God. I'm not serving the Lord for my peers. I'm serving the Lord for Him. Amen. Amen. Be willing to serve even when others don't. When everybody else sits and everybody else criticizes and everybody else ridicules and everybody else gossips, whether you're at the workplace, whether you're at the church, whether you're at home, be willing to get up and serve and do something for God. Amen. Look at him and say, hold ye your peace. <laughs> I liked that. That was a, a, a good way, amen, to say that. Next, letter E, and then we'll be done. He wanted to do more. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse number 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. I believe another part of being a servant and why God used Elisha was Elisha was never satisfied with just doing the bare minimum. Elisha wanted to do more for God. See, Elisha wasn't satisfied with just getting along. Boy, Elisha wanted to reach more people. Elisha wanted to do more for God. Elisha wanted bigger and better. Not because Elisha wanted to glorify himself, but Elisha wanted to glorify God. I believe that as a Christian we should never be satisfied with the minimum. You saw one person saved, now look for two. You saw two people saved, look for three. You've seen three people saved, look for four. You prayed for five minutes, great, now pray for ten. You prayed for ten minutes, great, now pray for fifteen. You read two chapters of your Bible, great, now read three. Always want to do more. Have a desire to do above and beyond. Don't just be satisfied with your Christian life and say, well, you know, I've been doing pretty good. No, do more for God. You know, because God wants to do so much more through our lives. But God can't use a Christian who's content. And not saying that you're not content. As Paul said, I've learned to be content in whatsoever state I am. Not saying you're not learned to be happy with whatever God gives you. Don't, but don't be content or be comfortable. Amen. Want to do more. Boy, God needs some servants. And we've got to have a servant's heart. In, a Christ, in Christianity, I believe that we could do so much more for the Lord and individual Christians could do more for the Lord if we would just offer ourselves as a servant. But that means that you're going to have to humble yourself. That means that you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. God's going to ask you to do something. You're going to go, I really don't think I can do that. God's going to say, hey, I don't, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. And you're going to go, God, what are, you're crazy. It's kind of like, you know, your dad... 
you know, or, you know, I remember working. My dad used to ask me to do things, and, uh, you know, he wanted to challenge me to do more, and I didn't know it at the time. You know, dad was smarter than I was, but I thought, dad, you're nuts. I can't do that. I'll tell you one of the times he did this to me, okay? He set me on top of the fridge, and he wanted me to jump down so he would catch me. I thought, you're crazy. He's like, I got you. And I said, no, nah, you're crazy. I wouldn't come down. Scared to death. I didn't realize Dad would actually catch me, but I was just scared. I was nervous. I mean, I'm on top of the fridge. You know how tall that is? It still scares me to get on top of the fridge. You know, sometimes God puts us in positions to where He wants us to trust Him. You've just got to take that step of faith and say, All right, Lord, <laughs> catch me. You know, God wants you to do that. God wants you to be a servant and be willing to do whatever God would ask Him to do. Some of you, maybe God will ask you to be a missionary. Maybe God will ask you to preach. Maybe God will ask you to be an evangelist. Maybe God will ask you to be a, mission, a, a, or an, or a pastor of a church uh, uh, here in, in Kansas. I don't know what God would have you to do, but be willing to say yes. Be willing to be a servant. Amen. Some of us, you know, you, uh, even for your children, you know, your children, God may want them to do something. But it starts with as we as an adults, as men and women that love the Lord, we teach our children how to be servants. Amen. You're teaching your children every day through your life how to serve and how to serve the Lord. If they see a mom and a dad that's not faithful to the Lord, they won't be faithful to the Lord. If they see a mom and a dad that's not faithful to serve God and has God first in their life, I promise you your children won't have God first in their life. Now, I'm not saying that your children will be perfect. The Lord knows uh, my, my dad probably looks at me and goes, What is that boy thinking? But you know what? You serve and, and you train your children up in the way they should go, and the Bible says they won't depart from it. But don't, but don't give the devil an, or the don't give sorry don't give the children an excuse, amen, by using your life and saying, well, mom and dad didn't. Why should I? Amen. They ought to be able to say, mom and dad did, and one day look at you and make a decision to say, you know, I probably should be. Amen. Let's be servants. Amen. Let's give the Lord. Let's let's serve the Lord. Have that servant's heart. The biggest thing about being a servant, and then we're done. We'll be done. I'm rambling now, and we got to go. Amen. I promise the Lord will be done. Biggest thing about being a servant, if I can, uh, if I could help in any way or be a blessing. Biggest thing about being a servant is doing is doing the little things. You know, especially in Christianity, God. There's a lot of little things that God asks us to do. You know, that sometimes we don't understand. We say, why, why do we do that? You know, or why this, why this, why, why, why? And I tell you, the biggest reason, and, and the biggest way to know, am I a critic or am I a servant, is if you always ask why. Not that asking why is a bad thing, but if that always stops you from doing what you know that God wants you to do, then we've got to get that right. Amen. Let's do those little things. There's little things that we know that God wants us to do that, boy, I tell you, it, it stops a lot of Christians from, from reaching that potential to serve God. But you know what? Once you do it, you go, boy, I'm sure glad I did. <laughs> You're like, boy, I'm, fi I'm glad I got that out of the way. You know, because the Holy Spirit's going to deal with you about it till the day that you do it. And you know, once you deal with it, it's kind of like getting saved. You know, once you finally just give in to the Lord, you trust Jesus as your Savior, You're like, boy, I'm sure glad I did that. I did that. You know, it's the same way with serving God. Same way with when God tells us or when the pastor says, hey, you know what, God wants you to do this. Boy, once you finally give in, you just go, you know what, I'm sure, glad it, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm glad I just listened. Amen. But if you, just, if you just keep fighting it, just keep resisting God, then boy, you're missing out. You're missing out on the greatest joy, and that's being a servant. I think the greatest joy that God's given to us that most people miss is just simply being a servant. We think that it's wealth. We think that it's being famous. We, the world, the devil's made us think that it's about making movies or making, uh, being a fancy music artist and all this stuff. But you know what? The world's missing out. The greatest joy that there is in life is just to be a servant for the Lord. Amen. So let's serve. Amen. I'll quit rambling. We'll be done. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the lesson. Lord, it's more of a Bible study, not a preaching time. Lord, and I've just given verse after verse and, Lord, principles to help. May we just take this through the week and study your word and study on it, Lord, how to be, Lord, better servants for you. Again, Lord, there's so much that we could cover, so many verses about being a servant, so many principles, but, Lord, we just don't have time to go over all that the Bible has, but Lord, may we take this home individually and study your word and may we, Lord, the biggest, the, the, probably the hardest thing to do, Lord, is apply 
Lord, what we've learned. Lord, may you help us to take this home. Lord, may we study it, and then may we, Lord, put it to practice, God. May we apply these things. Lord, would you just bless, Lord, all that we do and say. May we be a, a help and a, and, a, and a servant to others. Help me, Lord, to be a servant, Lord, as a pastor, Lord. Help me, Lord, where, you know that, where I know that, Lord, through studying your word, you've spoken to my heart. May, Lord, you have spoken to others as well. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord, for your people, Lord, their love for you, Lord. They wouldn't be here, Lord, if they didn't love you. They wouldn't be here, Lord, if they didn't want to be a servant. And I thank you, Lord, for that. I pray that you'd help them, Lord, to grow and grow and grow and, Lord, do more for you, Lord, than ever done before. We love you. I pray that you bless, Lord. Watch over these people, Lord, as they go home, as they go throughout their lives. Lord, some are going to be traveling. Lord, some are going to go to work. Some are, Lord, going to be at home. Some are working with children. Some are, Lord... Uh, doing different things throughout their life. God, would you watch each and every one of them, Lord, and I pray that you'd have your hand on them. And Holy Spirit, protect them, guide them, direct them. Lord, keep us from sin. Keep us, Lord, from the devil. Keep us, Lord, in your will. Keep us, Lord, right with you. And Lord, bring us back Sunday that we'd have a great service. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.